Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Andy Bodding and Glenn Guy, who are Python and television enthusiasts, who are talking to us today about uh, their project, Aussie Add-ons. Uh, thanks, Busy. Um, so, I'm Andy, this is Glenn. Uh, we've been working for some time on this project called uh, Aussie Add-ons. Uh, it was known as XBMC Catch Up TV AU, which was a bit of a mouthful. Um, and over time, we sort of diversified a little bit from just Catch Up TV to, um, uh, to sport and, and other streams as well. So, uh, Aussie add ons. Um, and uh, yeah, we're liberating Australian Catch Up TV with open source. Uh, so, we've got a bit of an outline here. Um, we're going to start by just talking a little bit about the status of the project, uh, some of the add-ons that we support, uh, and then we're going to go into um, uh, supporting our users, uh, some of the communication channels we have, a um, little bit about the de development. Um, Glenn's going to speak a little bit about the work that we've done to support DRM streams. Uh, and then we're going to talk a bit about uh, some reverse engineering efforts that we've uh, gone through to make this happen. Uh, and then towards the end, we'll have uh, some live demos, hopefully, if everything goes to plan. Um, and then we'll finish up with some of the challenges that our, projects, uh, our project faces. Uh, so I just wanted to find out uh, how many people in the audience uh, are using Kodi Media Center. OK, a few. Uh, how many of you have heard of our project? And how many of you are using our add-ons? Great. Excellent. That's really good. Um, so I won't go into too much here, uh, as most of you already know about Kodi, but um, uh, the add-ons for Kodi are written in Python. Um, Kodi itself uh, ships a version of Python in it. Um, so we're able to leverage uh, most of the standard Python libraries. and. Um, Kodi itself exposes some of its functionality uh, through Python as well that we can hook in for um, you know, enabling, disabling functions and, and things like that within Kodi itself. So, so we're able to, um, to build uh, quite sophisticated add-ons with, with, the, with the power of Python. Uh, and Kodi's great because it works on uh, a lot of different platforms too, so we're able to support users across a really wide uh, spectrum of um, operating systems and hardware. Uh, so currently the project status is that we, uh, we're supporting all of the Australian free-to-air catch-up TV stations. Um, it took a long time to get to this point uh, and it's, it, it's a difficult target to meet because the, uh, the services themselves change very frequently. Uh, and quite often, the only, the only way that we know that they've changed is we start getting a heap of error reports. Uh, and so then it's sort of a catch and, uh, cat and mouse game of trying to catch up. And, uh, and we've been pretty successful with that so far. Uh, so um, all the Australian free-to-air streaming services, um, we support catch-up TV, uh, live TV for uh, most of the services that, that have that. Uh, and we also have captions for most of the channels as well. Um, so we've, we've branched out into uh, some sport add-ons as well. Um, I think AFL is probably our most popular. Um, the, I think AFL, one of the most popular, one of the things that makes the AFL add-on so popular with our users is that um, uh, Telstra allow, um, as a Telstra mobile customer, you can get access to, to AFL and some of the other services as well. Uh, as a mobile customer, you get free access. Uh, so you're actually able to watch um, live AFL matches with that. Um, but the real, the real benefit of using our add-ons is you can actually watch them on your television. Um, the, I think the licensing, the licensing arrangements around Telstra's uh, streaming of live games is that they're, they're meant to be for mobile only. But obviously, watching a football game on your phone isn't a great experience. Um, so, so we're able to to provide that, uh, to provide access to that 
through Kodi so you can watch it on your TV. Uh, re resolution's not the best, but it's definitely watchable and it's definitely better than listening to the radio streams. Um, we support uh, NRL. Uh, Glenn's done a lot of work with uh, the NRL and netball add-ons. Uh, and they leverage the same, a lot of the same technology as the AFL. They're all kind of done through, uh, through Telstra, some sort of partnership with Telstra. I think they've done a lot of the work. Um, so a lot of the authentication mechanisms uh, and a lot of the, the streaming methods are, are the same across all of them. So, um, so it's generally a, a fairly, fairly easy, it, it's easy for us to support all of those. Um, in the future, uh, we'd like to support Foxtel Play uh, Glenn has been doing a lot of work with that. Um, Foxtel Play is a little bit harder for us because of the DRM that it uses, but um, uh, we're working through that. Uh, and I had a user contact me recently about uh, Cricket Australia, uh, and uh, he, he provided me a lot of debugging information, so uh, that's helped kickstart that, and I think we should be able to offer something around that uh, pretty soon. Uh, I've got Optus Football on there as well. I think Optus do the uh, Premier League, no. EPL, yeah. Uh, and I know there was a guy who was looking at that, but um, I don't know the status of that. There's nothing coming soon, anyway. Uh, so with the user support side, we've got a website um, that we wrote in Jekyll. Um, uh, Jekyll's really nice because uh, we can have all the content in, um, in GitHub. Uh, the pages are all in uh, Markdown and, um, uh, and it sort of goes through a, a template in the engine and uh, we're able to generate um, static HTML from that. Uh, we've got this really nice workflow where uh, any commits to the GitHub repo will um, trigger a Travis CI job which will automatically do the, the build of the website and, and push it up to S3 where we have it hosted. Um, so it's, it's really slick and um, hosting through S3 is, is really fast. Um, static HTML is, um, works quite well for us, I think. Uh, we've got a Slack channel. Um, you can see the link there. If you go to that link, uh, you can put in your email address. It'll send you an invite, uh, get access to the channel. Um, I think roughly maybe 80, 80 yeah, people or something 80. we've had, we've had sign up so far in probably six or eight months that we've had it running. Um, that's been really, really helpful uh, because we've been able to um, work through some issues that some users are having. Um, uh, so, like some obscure edge cases and things like that. Um, been, it's been quite good. Uh, yeah, we've got, we've got a Twitter as well. Um, we don't have many followers. We haven't really been all that active on there yet, but uh, any updates uh, go into that now. So. So if you're interested, follow that uh, to get the latest updates. Um, error reporting. Error reporting, uh, we've, we've got a mechanism now uh, whereby we, we catch a lot of the uh, exceptions that are thrown in Python in our add-ons. Uh, and when we catch those exceptions, we now prompt the users, uh, ask them if they want to send an automatic error report. Um, those error reports go up to a uh, GitHub, a, as a GitHub issue to a separate project that we have. Um, and within that error report, we, we attach um, some information about the user's platform, like what OS, uh, what version of Kodi they have, what's the version of the embedded Python, things like that. Um, we also include uh, some of their uh, geo IP information, so we'll include um, like the who is that we look up from their public IP, um, uh, what their ISP is, things like that. Um, and that's helped us uh, debug some issues around uh, geo-blocking and certain IPs or, um, or whether or not users are using like VPNs or, or proxy services which, which don't work a lot with a lot of these services. Um, and we attach the, the full Kodi log to that as well, so we can have a look through and see the whole stack trace and see what the user was doing to, to get to that issue. Uh, so that's it's really, really useful for us to um, 
see, especially if we've got, uh, if there's an edge case on some hardware that we haven't tested or if there's, um, you know, like some cases with Android or, or um, uh, anything that we haven't really been able to catch in our own testing, um, we, can, we can often get from these error reports from users. Um, we'd like to, in the future, add some sort of analytics because we, 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 we know we have a lot of users because when things break, we get a lot of emails, uh, which is really nice. But uh, it'd be really nice to have some more concrete information about how many users we have and what kind of platforms they're on and, and get some idea about maybe where we should be focusing our attention uh, to maybe more popular setups than others. And, uh, and just to have an idea about, about our user base. Uh, so we've got all our code on GitHub. Um, we have our own GitHub organization called Aussie Add-ons. Um, GitHub, GitHub's great really for us. Um, we build all our add-ons uh, through Travis CI, like I mentioned before. Um, we have a, a really nice workflow where we can, um, uh, any commits to any of the add-on uh, GitHub repositories uh, we'll go to Travis CI, Travis CI will uh, do the build for us, build the zip file that, that, um, in the format that Cody needs, uh, and then it will push it into the repository for us. So we have a, a testing repository and a production repository, and uh, any commit will go to the testing repository, uh, and then once we're happy with the, how the testing goes, we can then uh, tag a release and then tagged releases will go to the production repository. Um, so that for users that are having problems, we can direct them to the, the testing repository. They can test out if they've had specific issues that we've been looking into. Uh, and then once we're happy, we'll just tag the release and, and send it off. Um, and Travis CI handles the rest. We, we've been able, uh, the, the, the process we had before for deploying to, to our repositories was, was quite cumbersome. Uh, involves XML, um, uh, zipping things and pushing things around, and uh, it was a pain in the neck, really. So to automate that with Travis CI has been um, uh, a real bonus, and it definitely speeds up our our deployment time. Um, so for a development wish list, uh, we'd really like to do some code refactoring because a lot of our code is uh, it's it's old. Um, I think over time we've got a lot better at doing Python and doing work with our add-ons. Um, just, uh, just time is the issue these days. Uh, we'd also like to uh, in include some integration testing and unit testing. Um, uh, I'd, I'd really like to have, uh, I'd really like to have some integration testing so that we could test that we can hit the streaming services, get a, get a streaming URL and attempt to play that. Uh, as a full kind of end-to-end -end test. Um, not sure how I'm going to achieve that yet. Um, I'd love to do it with Travis CI, but with the geo-blocking, all the Travis CI servers are in the US, so that'll fail for our Australian stuff, so um, uh, more, more thought is needed there. Uh, so I'll pass to Glenn now. Glenn's going to talk about his work uh, with the DRM streams. Hello, everyone. Okay, so... Um yeah, want to talk a bit about DRM? Uh, boo! Uh, <laughs> it's not, not the most most popular thing to have come in the last uh, several years, but uh, to give a bit of history about how it's all worked within Cody um, for for quite some time now, um, probably forever, I, I guess. Uh, Cody has used uh, the FFmpeg libraries to to handle playing streams and and uh, decoding, everything else like that. Um, for the most part, it, all it can do is uh, files that are in containers, like your Matroska or, or Avi or QuickTime, and um, also HTTP, HTTP live streaming. So, um, but fast forward to where we are now, we're having a lot more content providers provide their content in uh, with MPEG Dash and to a lesser extent Microsoft Smooth Streaming. Um, so 
the way that the Cody developers have uh, dealt with this issue, um, instead of trying to build everything all into the core Cody components, uh, they've added a extensible interface for input streams. And that's where we've had in version 17, there's been developed one called input stream adaptive to deal with the adaptive bitrate streams that we have like uh, dash and, and smooth streaming and HLS as well. Um, so with that, the, the developers of that have also added in hooks into the code for us to use third party modules for, for DRM and other types of decryption. So with that, uh, we've, they've, um, uh, one of the D popular DRM options available that's been widely supported so far is Google's Widevine. And we can support that. Uh, most seven plus and nine now, I think uh, two of the ones that, that use that, that decryption scre uh, scheme, the DRM scheme. And um, so what, what, what we... Um, Demo uh, time. Sorry? Demo time. Oh, just a minute. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Get ahead of myself. <laughs> it, yeah, getting ahead of myself. So we can code, like the Cody can't distribute these third-party binaries uh, with with Cody itself, but the uh, the Widevine module, which is responsible for generating the, the challenge and getting the response from from Widevine itself, is bundled with Google Chrome, and that's available for most of the platforms that we use. So uh, whether it's Mac or Windows or even um, ARM as well is available. So. That and as, as well as a, a wrapper module, which is part of input stream adaptive, is needed to, to be able to watch these streams. The problem then comes for end users where it is, it's fairly difficult, well not difficult, but it's, it's not a straightforward process to, to find these and download them, put them in the right spot and get everything working nicely. So that's where we've um, developed the DRM helper add-on that um, is a, used as a dependency for our add-ons that need it. And um, yeah, helps us get a start to finish happening pretty easy. And we'll just give a, a quick demo of demo. that now. Yeah. Okay, so. Okay, so, so I've, got a, I've got a Cody set up here. Yeah, it's a, it's a fairly, uh, almost, almost fresh installation. So we're gonna go in and install the uh, Aussie add-ons repository which we've um, prepared a, a link to earlier. So this is pulling it from our, from our website. There we go, the repository is installed. Okay, and we'll go and install the uh, Nine Now add-on from the Aussie add-ons repository. You should see it pop up, see? There we go, so it's installed the DRM helper dependency there. You might have seen flash up on the screen. Okay, there it is installed. Yep, and we'll now find some content that's, um, it's, and it typically tends to be uh, overseas productions where I imagine the licensing agreements they have say that we need to go a little bit step further than, than just the HLS, which is quite easily, there's third-party tools around there to easily uh, circumvent it and download it. Whereas what they're doing here with the Widevine stuff is a you know an end-to-end -end solution that yeah it keeps the decryption key safe. There's there's no way to kind of really um, yeah take the content for for your own use. You can watch it, and when they don't want you to watch it anymore, it's gone. All right, so we've gone to play this content. It's now prompting us saying that Input Stream Adaptive isn't actually installed on the system and isn't available in any of the repositories. So we'll go ahead and ask it to, to download that, which we host up on our own organization's repository. Convert, we've compiled ourselves. There we go, it's installed. The next thing, um, we're missing our little wrapper library that comes, comes with it, so we'll grab that as well. That puts it in the appropriate place. There we go. And lastly, the, the 
the, um, <laughs> the, 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 the module that comes out of Chrome itself. So we're going to grab that directly from Google server. Nah. 4G connection struggling a little bit down here in the depths. It's slow, isn't it? Okay, all done. And with a bit of luck. Buffering. Buffering. <laughs> <laughs> so we say NBN. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, there, there we go. go. <laughs> okay. Okay, so done the demo. There you go. Okay, so uh, reverse engineering. Um, so, I mean, this this project started with. Um, with iView, um, and I think iView was, was probably the first to really uh, do catch-up TV really in Australia. Um, so when we started with that, uh, we, we did a lot of work with Wireshark, um, and we did a lot of work with Charles Proxy. Um, Charles Proxy is probably the most useful for this. Um, when, we were, when we were reverse engineering kind of the um, the, the the desktop browser type um, interfaces. Uh, so it, it integrates really nice with Firefox. Um, it'll show you, uh, it'll show you, you know, the, the content of all of the HTTP requests. You can see all the headers and, and all that sort of stuff. And then you can start to kind of pick it apart and work out how everything is generated. Um, uh, that we, we sort of moved on from there because. Uh, to our advantage, the, the TV stations have moved to, um, to providing mobile apps. Uh, and the benefit we have there is that the mobile apps connect to the server using a, a much cleaner, uh, better defined API rather than the, the old just sort of JavaScript method. Um, so what we do now is we use a combination of um, like man in the middle type snooping. Um, so. Uh, we've got some tools, uh, and I'm going to run some demos for that later. Um, and when things get really serious, we start uh, decompiling some of the mobile apps. Uh, and then we've even modified Android apps um, to, to help us uh, discover how, we'll discover keys and, and things like that that are used to, to sign requests. Um, so. So for the man in the middle stuff, we use uh, MITM proxy, uh, which is a really neat tool written in Python. Um, and I've got a setup where I've connect my uh, my Android device uh, to my laptop. Um, I set man the, the MITM proxy up in a um, transparent proxy mode, and set the gateway on the phone to my desktop, so I can see all the traffic going through. Um, there's a bit of a complication there with, with the uh, SSL certificates. Um, MITM proxy provides you a CA cert, uh, which you can install on your mobile device. Um, but with Android security, uh, it, it's, they've been improving security the last few releases. So there's a few, there's a few gotchas there. Um, the first one is uh, SSL pinning. SSL pinning is um, it's a technique where they uh, I think we've mostly seen this in the AFL add-on. Um, what they tend to do is they'll include a copy of the certificate that they expect um, to speak with on the API end. And they compare those two certificates, and if they don't match, then um, they fail the, the SSL verification. Um, there's a couple of ways around that. In Android uh, less than 7, you can use SSL unpinning 2, which is an exposed module. I don't know if you know much about um, uh, like the Android routing scene and stuff. Um, Expose is a nice framework that you can use for modifying the internals of, of how the Android system works. Um, with Android greater than 7, uh, or 7 or greater, you can use um, Magisk. 
uh, which, is, which is a very similar method, but a um, uh, bit newer, a bit more advanced. Um, there's a couple of modules there, if you're interested in that. Um, in Android 7 and greater, there's uh, a, another feature that Android included, which was um, uh, not trusting user certs. So we have to take another step where we, uh, we install the MITM proxy certificate as a user cert, and then on a rooted device, we're able to uh, convert that certificate from a user cert to a system certificate, and then it is trusted. So um, it's, it's tricky to find these out, but once you do, it becomes trivial. Um, so I'm going to give you a demo of this. Uh, this is, uh, I've got my, hang on, let me cancel that. Clear that. Okay, so you can see I've got, uh, oh, let me show you the script I used to start this. Um, cat start. You see that all right? Um, so we do some standard kind of, IP forwarding stuff that I'm sure you've seen before. Um, I've got some IP tables rules here which then direct anything from uh, port 80 or port 443 over to the uh, port that the MITM proxy is listening on. Uh, and then I start it in transparent proxy mode there. Um, so I've got it running here. Uh, and I can show you, I could just start up iView there. And then you can see the request start coming coming in. Um, so let's have a look. What have we got here? Uh, what I'll do is I'll apply a filter and I'll say HQ host. <coughs> so, so that just applies a filter. It'll only show me any requests to servers that start with iView. Um, and then I can have a look and say, if I have a look at the response. I can start to see, you start to see the JSON return that that generates this display that you see on the phone here. Um, I can open up one of these programs, and I can see uh, that one there, and that shows us all the details about the program. And so we can, we can parse all this and we use it to generate our lists um, in Kodi. Uh, and then if I start that, you'll start to see this one in particular. Uh, we can start to see that there's, in that get request, there's a, there's a string there. Uh, starting with sig up here. Uh, so that, that shows us that the, uh, the request is being signed by some magic that we don't know yet. Uh, so the aim here is then to find out how that works. So I will stop this. Let's go back to here. Uh, so this brings us to uh, decompiling Android apps. Um, so there's a few tools here. That, um, that come out of the kind of security analysis space. Um, and we can use these tools to, uh, to, to, to peek inside the, the Android apps themselves and, and, and start to see how they're built. Um, so I've got a, let's see. So this is a tool called uh, JADX GUI. Um, this is great because we can just open up the Android app and it basically converts the compiled Android uh, DEX into, um, into just about readable Java. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this file here. Uh, that's a little bit small, but you, you don't really need to see too much of that. Um, if I go down to... If I go into here, you can see there's a, there's a function there called token. So that's, that's where the magic happens. And we can see that in this line here, uh, that's the URL that we were just looking at in our, um, 
in our man in the middle snooping. Um, so we can see that there's a secret value here. So that's really what we're looking for. We're looking for that secret value. Um, if I look at, let's have a look into this one. So this was the function that was being called. So this, uh, this uses uh, a, stand, a standard kind of Java uh, function here for generating the, the kind of secret, secret key type stuff. Um, uh, not, not that interesting there, but if I go and have a look uh, down to this one, this is where it gets really interesting. Um, this is what we discovered was the, this is the function that's providing that secret key. Um, so Paul Glenn here actually went through all this code um, and, and worked backwards and <laughs> worked it all out by hand. But I don't know if you can see too much, but there's, it, it's pulling in all sorts of random uh, random Java classes from all over the app that, that don't really make any sense. And when it's calling secret key spec here, it's, it's pulling in all these things that, that, that really are kind of baffling. Um, it comes down to here, string response. This is like, like a weird array, and then it does some stuff, and you know, I don't know what's going on there. So, um, so we can see that there's something going on there. And rather than try and work through it all, like Glenn did, um, we, we, might just, uh, we might just go back to here. We might just modify it. Um, we're able to use uh, a couple of tools here. Uh, the first one is APK tool. APK tool allows us to decompile the Android app. Um, also allows us to repackage the Android app up. Um, when it decompiles it, uh, it's compi uh, decompiling into a language called Smarly, which is a bit like a, um, an assembly type language. So it's not as readable as we were just looking, but the benefit is that we can modify it and then repackage it up and, and the phone will, will handle that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start another demo here. Uh, this one, I think. So I've got my decompile command here. So what I'm doing is I'm just decompiling the, the Android app. OK, that's done. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy in, uh, it's a little utility called iglogger. Um, so I've copied that into uh, where the the iView source is. I'll just show you. So it's it, it's kind of a bit nasty, but it, it's enough that you can sort of generally understand what's going on. But you wouldn't really want to be coding in this. Um, so I've copied this in. This is going to help us. Um, uh, this helps us do logging out to the console. So now that that's in there. Um, I'm going to edit that file we were just looking at. This is the API implementation file that we were just looking at in Java. Uh, if I scroll up to scroll up to here, so this is our token method. Um, and if I go down to this line here, you can see param p4 is secret. So that's the parameter to the function. Um, and so in this in this language here, we can see that that's that parameter is being assigned to uh, P4. So if I go back down to 3140, uh, this invoke static line here is the first place that it's used. You can see that P4 is listed there, so that parameter is being passed through to the, the crypt tools function. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just, uh, I'll just put a little line in here. 
So that calls our logger function, and I just pass P4 into that. Sorry? Oh, I can't hear you, sorry. Yeah, no, that's, that's intentional. It's a benefit of the language. Um, oh, I'll just show you the build script before I run it. Can't build. Um, so we use APK tool again to, uh, uh, to package up the file. We use jar signer and um, uh, we zip align. Um, just standard kind of Android stuff. So I'll build that. I'll just take a moment. Okay, done. So what I've done is I've just signed that with my Android debugging key, um, so that'll so it'll run, um, and that's all it needed really. Um, I can now install this new patched version onto my handset. Success. Okay, so app still running, that's a good sign. If you haven't got it right, it just crashes. Uh, and then I can do, uh, I can use logcat. Okay, so that's our, that's our console from the, uh, from the phone. Um, and then I'll just kind of pick something. All right, so, so with that, uh, so I'm passing logcat here through grep um, just to highlight the line that we find. So when you see the red bit, we should see our secret key. Quick play, and there it is. And so there's our secret key. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know why they've done that, but it's using this kind of standard uh, Android Java package name as their secret key, so <laughs> go figure. And poor old Glenn here, he thought it was a mistake. <laughs> um, so. so now with that information, we can then, uh, we can then replicate that in Python. Um, so the secret key, uh, those functions that we were just looking at before, uh, they, they're, they're basic kind of uh, standard SSL type functions. Um, there's plenty of support for that in Python. Um, so, so it's very easy to implement from there once we find the magic. So Glenn, uh, talk about some challenges. Yeah. Um, look, moving forward, uh, VPN and proxies, they, they still cause us daily headaches, or not so much headaches, but users, it's causing them the headaches. Uh, a lot of people like to run a VPN at home and um, yeah, a lot of these services now are crawling onto people trying to geo-block or circumvent the geo-blocking. So, yeah, that they're building up quite a bit of a blacklist themselves to um, deny permission to, to access their content through these services. And um, so I guess one of the ways we're thinking about dealing with that is um, implementing our own blacklist for error reporting and perhaps having a little message to go with it saying, hey, if if you've got your VPN on, maybe you should turn it off or be in Australia if you want to <laughs> access the content. Um, something else that, that plays a bit of havoc is these uh, bad repositories that are out there that, um, that, that, that contain all the, um, I guess, highly publicised illegal streaming add-ons that Cody's kind of got a bit of a bad name for. Um, and one of the things we've found that they do is they'll include uh, Say the same dependencies that some of our add-ons need, like the Python requests library. But um, whatever version they're using, they're putting, they're listing theirs as a, a newer version than what we have. So Cody will automatically try and obtain their version of it, which is in fact an old version, and um, then things break. So 
that's users that's, get really confused in these situations. So yeah, yeah, and and you know, it kind of comes back to us, and it, it's it's your add-on's not working. Why? It's your your problem, your fault. So um, there's always a lot of explaining behind that, and then uh, the super repositories, which is another one, um, like where it's TV add-ons or super repo. And they're like uh, aggregators of sorts. And um, one of the ones we've found is Super Repo uh, redirects incorrectly to our GitHub uh, organization and 404s all the time. And again, a similar kind of thing happens. People have our repository installed, but I guess the Super Repo one comes up first in the list while Co Cody's searching for the add-on to install and the dependencies and, and things break again. So, so we've got to try to come up with a way to um, mitigate that somehow, yeah. or at least help users out. Yep. Um, always playing catch up, that's another thing. I mean, uh, Andy mentioned that before where, you know, iView will decide to change their API totally, or like the other week, several weeks ago, we had plus seven with their clever rebrand to seven plus. And um, I'm sure that it's not just the Cody users that are confused over that, it's probably everyone in the country, but, um, uh, it's their decision, I guess, and um, yeah, they they switched, uh, they released their new app for Seven Plus, and within about two or three days, the content on Plus Seven pretty much dried right up. Um, there was about 20 shows that were still on there, as opposed to normally a couple of hundred, I think. So, yeah, that um, so we all that, that's that's something we always got to try and keep on top of, and. And um, I guess uh, something else that'll be coming up at the start of the football season for NRL and AFL. I think Andy and I will be at our computers. Every, every season they, they want to change how, the, how all the functions work and the auth works and everything. So every season it's the same. Yeah, and um, it's, it's not too bad with the AFL one. There's a constant live stream that runs on there. So we can kind of test all the time, like 24 seven if we need to. They've got the, uh, the, the channel that runs on the Telstra, Telstra box. But with uh, NRL, it's um, there's got to be a game on to really do any development. So I get this uh, this kind of three-hour window, and um, then it's over. <laughs> and, then, and so yeah, it's uh, <laughs> makes it tricky. And, yeah, bit bit difficult at times. But yeah, but on the plus side, we do have some great users that are willing to they jump on Slack and help us debug and and we'll give them instructions and they just go ahead and do it and you know, it does really help things along. Yeah. along. But um, yeah. Yeah, we've had some really good feedback um, and especially, we, we find especially uh, good feedback from people who have small kids. You know, they, they uh, yeah. a lot of them are using ABC iView for, um, uh, for the kids channel. So uh, there's a lot of thankful parents out there. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Yeah. I was one of them, that's how I got started, so. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's it from us. And, um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'd uh, be happy to, to, to answer. Yeah, I think, I think we've got time for a couple yeah, of questions, yeah. Maybe, yeah, we'll just repeat it out, so yell out. Uh, the question was, any love for Myth TV? Uh, not at this stage, no. Actually, one of the things that I'm interested in is, is maybe um, working with uh, Plex. Plex has a channels thing, um, and, and I think it's Python as well, um, but we, we haven't looked into that yet. Uh, I think there's a community around that as well, but um, we haven't, haven't gone anywhere with that yet. Uh, yes? Okay, so the question was um, that um, uh, uh, have we looked essentially, into... Essentially downloading that for offline viewing. Yeah, looked into any sort of solution to help with people with buffering problems by you know, offloading and building up a bit of a buffer of our own. Uh, it's a bit of a grey area there. Um, we're, we're obviously breaking terms and conditions here. Um, <laughs> but we've, we've not had any issues so far. Uh, nobody's, 
no lawyers have come after us or anything yet. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, iView downloader. This is a few years ago from Jeremy Visser. Um, the ABC contacted him uh, and told him to take his stuff down. Um, and so I, I hope that we're sort of treading that fine line between uh, you, you know, allowing users to use open source to watch this stuff uh, you know, and, and avoid piracy as opposed to you know, actually downloading it and, and maybe really annoying these guys. Yeah, yeah there are um, settings within Kodi I think in the advanced settings where you can specify to to have an increased buffer size to, to try to download them. I'm not sure how well it works, but I know there is that. But as far as integrating into like a into a PBR type uh, thing, yeah, that might be and where users would then have the added functionality of being able to record. I think that's when we'd really start to anger some people. Um, yeah, yeah, Tom. One more. I'd, I'd love to actually. Um, so, sorry, so the question was there's lots of separate apps. Is there any um, plan or scope to be able to combine them into one aggregated app with all the content? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, what, what I'd really like to do is, uh, is break apart these, uh, these separate add ons and like, implement each one as a library and then be able to have one add-on that can interface to these libraries. Um, it's just too hard, I think, basically. Um, the, the way that all the streaming services work are all different, and, and I think it would involve uh, some sort of uh, fetching and storing, and then users maybe look at that index or something. But that might, I think that might require us to host something to... To, to do that, store that kind of information, and um, we, we don't really have the resources, or um, yeah, we don't really have the resources to probably do that at this stage. But from a user experience point of view, I think that would be really, really good. Yeah, it is something I'm thinking about. I think I think that's it, isn't it? Yeah. We'll be outside if you have more questions. But thanks very much. Thanks, Matt.